I've been a regular reader of this sub for over a year now. Ironically, it was my wife who suggested it. You see, she's always been worried that I never really opened up to anyone but her about how her affair hurt me and changed me. I think she fears I might harbor some repressed hatred for her. I don't. It's like touching a hot stove. Once you do it, you never do it again on purpose. I handle my emotions the same way. I have feelings, but I choose to keep some of them safe within myself. Recently, I created a username and began posting because one particular story struck a chord with me more than others. I talked with my wife, showed her what I wrote to another user, and asked if she was okay with me sharing our story. She not only agreed, but encouraged me to include more details than I'd planned. Her reasoning was that people needed the full picture to understand why she worked so hard to reconcile with me, why it succeeded for us, and how I now see our love and marriage so differently. After writing the first draft, I read it and felt uneasy about how my wife appeared in the story in our marriage. Although she had no issue with the story as written, I decided to add this preface. My wife has become an amazing partner, mother, and woman. She holds a professional degree and is well-regarded in her field. She suffered greatly too, partly due to her own actions and also from the pain I inflicted during our reconciliation. She emerged from the fire stronger, like steel. Her betrayal was devastating, but in my case, the circumstances around the affair ultimately allowed me to forgive her. Not excuse her, but forgive her. I lost a part of my goodness through this pain. In contrast, she became a better person. Sometimes I resent that. But then I see the positive impact she has had on my life over the past 23 years, and it's okay. I'm writing this in chronological order, some events I didn't learn about until later. The details come from writings my wife did for therapeutic reasons something she incorporated into our reconciliation process. We still have those notebooks. We plan on burning them on our 50th wedding anniversary. Background We got married when we were both 20. About a year later, I decided to go back to school part-time to finish my degree. Eventually, we had a child, and I felt the pressure to finish my education. My son had just turned two when I started my last year of college. I only needed two more semesters. In September 1993, my schedule was as follows. Part-time job from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. at a store. Full-time job at the police department in an administrative role from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. School on Tuesday nights from 5.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. And school on Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. My wife worked as a nurse's aide at a local hospital from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. My mother took care of our son. Everything, school, jobs, and my parents, was within a 10-minute drive. We had the best setup possible for what I was trying to achieve. D-Day The weekend before D-Day, we fought constantly. It was spring of 94, finals week for me. If I finished my papers and passed my finals by Sunday, we would celebrate my completing my bachelor's degree and ending this grueling eight-month schedule. But she was upset because I wouldn't take time off from studying to take her and our son out. She had been complaining about my work and school for some time, and it had gotten so bad that we had stopped having sex two months earlier. On that Monday evening, I was fact-checking a research paper due Tuesday, and she kept picking fights. Finally, I snapped and told her to shut up and quit acting like a child. She looked at me and boldly declared, I hate you and I am in love with someone else. Just like that. I was stunned. We argued for about an hour until she confessed what had happened earlier that day at lunch. For the past two months, she had started an emotional affair with the janitor at the hospital. It began with him complimenting her and always being around. This led to them having lunch together in the cafeteria and eventually complaining about me to him. Two weeks prior, they moved their sessions to the car. She admitted to kissing him twice, but that day it escalated to a full makeout session where she gave him a hand job while he fingered her and they professed their love for each other. Upon hearing this, I felt like I detached from reality. I will delve deeper into my thought process that night later. Meanwhile, this is what my wife wrote about that moment. It was strange. When I told him what we had done, I was fully prepared for some type of outburst. He just looked at me with the most horrible pain you can imagine. Then something indescribable happened. He turned away, walked to the bedroom, and quietly closed the door. I remember getting furious then. The bastard wouldn't even fight for me. At that moment, I was convinced I'd made the right decision and that everything was going to work out. I was finally breaking free from the man 
who had ignored me for months. I went back to the living room, grabbed a suitcase, and walked past her out the front door. She kept asking where I thought I was going. Running home to mommy, I remembered thinking. I placed the suitcase in the driveway, went back inside, grabbed her purse, and held it out, telling her to leave. She was shocked. She refused. I gently picked her up, carried her outside, and set her on the hood of the car. Her shock gave me enough time to get back inside and lock the door. She tried to get back in, but I held the deadbolt, and eventually, she left to stay at her parents. She told them we were separating, but not why. That night felt endless. I called into both jobs explaining that a family emergency had come up and I wouldn't be in the next day. At some point, I fell asleep. Tuesday, D-Day, plus one. I woke up at seven and immediately started planning how to minimize contact with my soon-to-be ex. I called my mother to ask her to keep my son. She was worried because he wasn't there by then. After that, I made a list of tasks for the day and started working through it. First, I dropped my son off and explained to my mother that I would need to talk to her at length later. Then, I went to see a lawyer friend of the family who had gone to school with my dad. I explained that I wanted to file for divorce as soon as possible. He listened and suggested I think about it for a while, but I was adamant. He said he could have the papers ready by the end of the day. I told him I would pick them up and file them with the clerk's office myself. I dealt with these things regularly at my job with the PD. Next, I went to get new locks for the house and made a stop at the bank. I emptied and closed both our savings and checking accounts. I put half the money in an envelope and dropped it off at my sister-in-law's workplace, telling her to give it to my wife and inform her that she shouldn't contact me. I also told her I had canceled our only credit card. Back at my mom's, I told her everything. She and my little sister came up with a plan for my sister to stay at my house and watch my son while I worked and went to school for the rest of the week. I went home, changed the locks, spent the afternoon cleaning and playing with my son, and then went to school. My wife also decided not to go to work that day. She contacted the janitor and told him what had happened. He was sympathetic and invited her to his house that evening to escape the stress. Long story short, she went and slept with him. Here's what she wrote about that night. He fell asleep after. I remember being so excited at the beginning, but during and after, it began to feel wrong. Since he was asleep, my mind began to wander. I thought about G and how he had pushed me to find someone else. I got up and left. On the drive home, I remembered the first time G and I had sex. We were each other's firsts. I broke down, disgusted with myself. Then I got mad at G all over again. It was a sick cycle. I wouldn't face the responsibility of my actions and convince myself it was his fault. Wednesday, D-Day. Plus two. That day began as usual. I went to work, came home, showered, and had breakfast with my son and sister. My wife called, wanting to arrange a visit with our son. She was cocky and spiteful on the phone. I told her she could see him on Sunday at 1 p.m. at the local park. She wasn't happy with that and wanted him for the weekend. I said no. She knew having him at home solved the babysitting issue for now, so she didn't push it. She slammed the phone down. I went to work at the PD and at the first opportunity, I went to the clerk's office and filed for divorce. Later, a girl I knew there informed me that the papers were ready to be served. I called a deputy I knew, explained the situation, and asked him to serve them to her at work. He agreed to do it the next day. My soon-to-be ex returned to work. The janitor came by her station, chatting her up throughout the day. They couldn't have lunch together or meet that evening because he had something with one of his kids. He had told my wife he was divorced with three kids. After work, she went to her parents. Later that night, she called me three times, and each time I hung up as soon as I realized it was her. Caller ID wasn't common back then in my area. Thursday D-Day plus three. Another sleepless night of torment passed, and my day began like any other. I went to work. When I got to my second job, the deputy called, saying he'd serve the papers around noon. I said that would be fine, knowing her lunch break was from 11 a.m. to noon. Restless and anxious, I found myself in the restroom multiple times until I eventually vomited. I kept telling myself this was the right thing to do. Thankfully, my wife hadn't reached out yet. At 11 a.m., my wife met the janitor for lunch. 
They retreated to his car in the parking lot and engaged in their sordid affair. How utterly degrading. Afterward, they tidied up, went back inside, and grabbed something from the cafeteria. Noon. My wife returned to the nurse's station with the janitor and started chatting with the RN in charge. Just five minutes later, the deputy walked in. He asked the RN where Kay, my wife, was. She answered, that's me. The deputy turned to her and in a loud voice said, Mrs. Kay, you are being served divorce papers due to infidelity. My wife collapsed to the floor. Here's her account. When I heard that, a tidal wave of shame and guilt crashed over me. It struck me that I had truly destroyed my marriage, and he was serious about divorcing me. Some deluded part of me thought he wouldn't go through with it. I thought this was just another argument to win. Sick thinking. I remember the deputy physically lifting me and placing me in a chair. I was screaming. It was me. A, the RN, was trying to calm me down. T, the janitor, tried to hold my hand, and I lashed out, punching him. He turned his head and my punch landed on his neck. I scratched him as he pulled away. A said I was yelling at him, blaming him for ruining my life. Eventually, they calmed her down. The deputy mentioned that the janitor left immediately. She managed to finish her shift, but A covered for her a lot. 2.45 p.m. Close to the end of her shift, my wife was summoned to the hospital administrator's office. Terrified, she guessed someone had reported her outburst. When she arrived, the administrator shut the door and bluntly informed her she was fired banned from the property, and her final check would be mailed. Someone had seen the affair in the parking lot and reported it. I had been called in and recounted the story about the divorce papers. The janitor had been questioned, fired, and escorted off the property just an hour before my wife was dismissed. The entire hospital was abuzz with the scandal. She says she simply went to her car and drove to her parents. They still didn't know the full story, only that she and I were separating, and it was serious. 5.30 p.m. I was at home having dinner with my son. My sister was out with friends, so it was just the two of us. The deputy had filled me in on the day's events, and I felt a grim satisfaction knowing her reaction. The janitor being present was sheer luck. I was amazed she hadn't been arrested for hitting him, but hey, you can't have it all. Then there was a knock at the door. A short, heavily pregnant woman stood there, barely able to stand straight. She asked for Kay. I told her Kay no longer lived here and wouldn't be returning. She asked if I was her husband. I replied, soon to be ex-husband. I served the papers today. She introduced herself as D, the janitor's wife, and mentioned she was pregnant with their fourth child. I let her in to sit down. She explained the day's events, about her husband and my wife getting fired, and the circumstances around it. I felt sick to my stomach. Who was this monstrous woman I had married? She also mentioned the house where my wife met him. At that moment, I could have killed him in cold blood. Not for my wife, but for humanity. This guy was pure scum. Again, more on the house later. She asked where my wife was, and I explained she was at her parents. I gave her directions after she assured me she only wanted to talk and reveal the truth. My son, still seated at the table, was visible from where we sat in the living room. She commented on what a great father I was to take care of my son alone. She got up and left. 6.30 p.m. My father-in-law answered the door, and D asked to speak with Kay. Thinking she was a friend, he fetched Kay, who stepped out onto the porch. D revealed her identity, and that she wanted to know the truth about the janitor. D and the janitor were still married and living together. She was eight months pregnant with their fourth child. Kay, now sobbing, kept apologizing, but it got worse. The janitor and two other guys at the hospital had been playing a sick game. The goal was to see how many married women they could bet in 90 days, until my wife, the third guy, was leading with three. My wife was the janitor's third conquest, and the night he claimed to be with one of his kids, he slept with his fourth woman. D said this woman had been married for 25 years, and D was informing her husband next. It was their neighbor. The house was a secret location they rented to take their victims. D found out about everything two hours after he was fired. He came home, high and sobbing, and spilled his guts in a desperate bid to salvage their marriage. D packed up the kids and told my wife she was leaving him. Then, with a fierce resolve, she slapped my wife hard across the face and called her a worthless, home-wrecking fool. Kay stood there, stunned. 
Dee lambasted her, saying she should be ashamed for destroying her own family. She recounted how she had seen me at home, feeding our son alone because his mother was a selfish, unfaithful whore. My wife broke down, crying uncontrollably as Dee walked away, got into her car, and left. My in-laws found her catatonic and got her inside, debating whether to take her to the emergency room. She started rambling incoherently, and my father-in-law suspected she was on drugs. She babbled about how terrible she was and how she needed to fix everything. They eventually calmed her down and pieced together the story. My father-in-law was deeply hurt. He's always been a good man. He later told me she could see the shame and disappointment on his face. My mother-in-law predictably blamed me. I've never liked her. Immediate aftermath. The next day, my father-in-law called me to apologize, the only time I ever suspected he might be crying. He told me what had happened and said Kay had been in her room all day and night. I reminded him about the meeting at the park on Sunday. He agreed and hung up. I worked Friday and went to school on Saturday. By the end of the day, I learned I had passed and would receive my degree. Bittersweet, but I made it. My parents celebrated with a family cookout that night. I have a great family. No one mentioned Kay. Sunday. The next day, Kay didn't show up at one. I considered it a blessing, something useful in a custody hearing if needed. At 3.30, her father called, saying Kay was still incoherent, wandering around in her bathrobe, clutching a notebook she wouldn't let go of. She hadn't bathed in days and ate only sporadically. He was exhausted and worried, afraid to sleep in case she harmed herself. He asked me to come see her. I declined. I felt nothing for her. I told him to get her some help and that I'd let her see our son when she got herself together. That first night, I went through my own trial by fire and emerged stronger. More on that later. I was determined not to care about her ever again. I didn't hear from her or her family for two weeks. Reconciliation Two weeks passed without contact from my father-in-law. During that time, I quit my part-time job and started looking for a new one. I had plans to get my MBA but wanted to settle into a new job first. My son asked about his mother, and I could only comfort him. The longer she stayed away, the better my chances for a favorable custody arrangement. I was at the PD when she called, asking to set up a time to see our son. I asked if she had pulled herself together enough not to scare him, and she assured me she had. I told her I would meet her at 9 a.m. at the park on Saturday and to bring her dad. I didn't want to meet her alone. My mother came with me. When I saw her, I knew I made the right decision to limit her contact to only two hours. She was a wreck. She had lost a lot of weight, wasn't wearing makeup, and smelled like plain soap, none of the feminine scents I associated with her. I later found out her mother had bathed and dressed her. Kay wasn't functioning fully yet. Park meetings continued for three weeks, then I extended them to four hours and included Sundays. She looked better each week but I was still concerned about her mental health and wouldn't let her have our son overnight or see him alone. Eventually, my mother-in-law grew impatient and hired an attorney to sue for custody. Kay hadn't signed the divorce papers yet, and I was okay with that. In six months, I could petition the court for a divorce anyway. But the custody suit infuriated me because she was suing for full custody. I had already told her father I was willing to work up to 50. 50 custody, but her mother ruined that. I responded by requesting full custody on the grounds of her mental instability. I was ready to fight. I was angry and needed an outlet. This was it. The custody hearing. On the day of the custody hearing, my lawyer told me Kay's attorney wanted to speak with me privately. I initially refused. He suggested it might be an offer, so I agreed but insisted it be in the hallway outside the courtroom, within view of both attorneys but out of earshot. They agreed. She started with small talk asking how I and our son were doing. I said we were great and improving every day. She asked about my school. I told her I passed and graduation was next week. She was happy for me. Then she looked down and asked if she could come to see me graduate. I told her graduation was for my family and friends, and she was neither. So no, that really hurt her. We had worked hard for my family and friends, and she was neither. So no, we had worked hard together for the majority of our relationship. And me saying no made it clear she couldn't share this milestone with me. She pleaded, but I told her no again. I said, It's special to me. It didn't matter enough to you when you let someone use you like trash. I was really becoming an a-hole, and I wanted to hurt her. She teared up, turned around, and walked back to her attorney. 
The hearing. The hearing began. I testified, recounting the events. Nothing unusual. Then my mother-in-law took the stand and placed all the blame on me. She claimed I was seeing someone else and that it drove my wife crazy. There was no proof, but she never cared about the truth. She also alleged that I assaulted my wife by throwing her on the hood of the car the night she left. Then it was my wife's turn. Kay started answering questions from her lawyer, but stopped after the third one. She asked the judge if she could speak. He advised her to confer with her attorney, but she declined. He allowed her to proceed. Here's my wife's account from her notebook. I remember feeling incredibly sad as the hearing began. I listened to G explain how he had taken care of Jay, our son, all these weeks. I realized I needed to make things right. Listening to my mother lie to protect me was just another lie on top of so many others. I had enough. I had to fix this. Kay then apologized to my parents, who were in the room. She also apologized to her own parents. She looked at me and said she knew I hated her more than anyone in the world. She admitted everything was her fault and just wanted to salvage anything she could of what we had, even if it was just for me to look at her without disgust. She then told the judge she wanted to withdraw her claim and would accept any custody arrangement I deemed fit. I conferred with my attorney, and we offered supervised one-hour visits for six weeks, with our son staying with her every other weekend if there were no issues. We adjourned. Looking back, I think that was when I saw a small glimmer of hope that we could be civil. Not reconcile, but at least be cordial. The visitation schedule worked fine. After the third week, we spent the visitation time together with our son. It usually extended to three or four hours. I wasn't friendly, but I enjoyed watching my son play with his mom. It helped them both. The only negative incident happened during the fifth visit. She came up behind me and hugged my arm while I was watching our son play. I freaked out and yelled at her to never touch me again. She hugged our son and left quickly. The next week, we pretended it never happened, and she kept her distance. Another month passed, and we started talking more about day-to-day -day issues. I had a new job that paid better, and she had started nursing school. She began telling me that the janitor was harassing her and wouldn't leave her alone. She claimed she wanted to be honest in case I heard. He even showed up at her parents' house one night. My father-in-law threatened to kill him if he didn't leave her alone. I told her I didn't care who she slept with anymore. She insisted she wasn't sleeping with anyone and wouldn't until she knew we could never put our family back together. I told her it was never going to happen. The Notebooks Six months after our separation, I brought up the need for her to sign the divorce papers. She refused. I reminded her I didn't need her signature, but it would be easier if she cooperated. She asked if she could come by the house that night to talk, and if I still wanted a divorce, she would sign the papers. I agreed. She showed up with these small black composition notebooks. She said she started writing things down the day after receiving the divorce papers. It helped her process everything. She wanted me to read them, but warned it would be painful. She had written everything she could remember about what had happened, in as much detail as possible. She wanted me to understand why she was trying to save our marriage, so I read it. She was right. It was hard. The sex parts were not overly detailed, but what she said about me and our marriage to him cut deep. The notebook also chronicled her mental breakdown. The writing was jumbled and unorganized at first, but became clearer each day. She eventually began dissecting her actions, using the writing as therapy. One bizarre passage described her belief that if she never had an orgasm with another man, it meant she didn't enjoy it and therefore did nothing wrong. She believed this until she explained it to her father, who, much to his discomfort, told her it didn't work that way. Reading the notebook didn't change my mind, but it did scare me. I was still deeply worried about her mental state. It wasn't until I read her writings from those two weeks that I realized just how fragile her mind had become. I decided to give it more time, which seemed to give her the courage to start pushing me to write as well. She suggested that I sit down and write a letter or something about what had happened so she could better understand how to help me. I mulled it over, knowing I was still messed up, and thought maybe it could at least help me move on and maintain some type of healthy relationship down the road. Her writing therapy, as I called it, evolved into structured meetings twice a week. Our first assignment, was to write down our perceptions of the state of our marriage prior to D-Day. During our meetings, we exchanged letters and made notes. 
We then wrote down questions for each other and discussed them until every question was fully answered. If we didn't finish, we extended the discussion to the next meeting. The rules were simple. Answer honestly, no yelling, and no declining to answer any question. We started by analyzing our pre-D-Day marriage and went through each subsequent day until the Sunday I spoke with her father after she received the divorce papers. After that, we planned to reevaluate. I was a complete dick about it. I answered questions honestly, except for one more on that later, but I used it to humiliate her. I made her repeat the hurtful things she said about me to him over and over. I forced her to give excruciating details about their sexual encounters. She balked sometimes, but she always went through with it. While what they did was really vanilla compared to what she and I did when we were together, it still hurt deeply to hear it. I thought I could handle it because I wasn't interested in getting back together, but it was incredibly painful. It's hard to believe how cruel I had become, but at the time, it felt justified. After about a month of this, I had to admit it helped me somewhat. She proposed moving back in to try the next step, but I said no. She begged, offering a good argument, but I remained firm. I told her that even if I wanted to reconcile, there was no way I could be intimate with her again. She was okay with that, suggesting I could go outside the marriage while she stayed faithful. But that wasn't me, so I refused. Another month passed, and I finally relented, but with strict rules. These rules were non-negotiable and set in stone. First, she had to sleep in the spare room. Second, absolutely no physical contact. Third, she kept her money in her own checking account. But I handled her banking and gave her checks to pay her bills, including rent for the room and other expenses. This was because she had given the janitor $300 from our savings a week before D-Day. Plus, I thought she would refuse and not move in. Fourth, her mother was not allowed in my home until we decided to reconcile. I was still angry with her. Fifth, all prior custody agreements would automatically kick in if we didn't reconcile. Sixth, if I found someone else, she had one week to move out. She agreed and moved in. It was harder than I anticipated. I no longer had the cooling down period between seeing her. She was there all the time. I started small fights constantly, said hateful things to her. I wanted her out almost immediately after she moved back in. To cope, we implemented Thursday night fight night. This came from our writing meetings. Every Thursday night after the kid was asleep, we would sit in the living room and discuss ongoing issues or arguments that needed settling. These had to be resolved before bed and couldn't carry over. We still have a version of this today, where we ask each other over dinner if there's anything to talk about that night. The kids never knew the origin or what it was really about. I continued being difficult. I threw her affair in her face at every opportunity. She took it in stride and never engaged when it reached that point. I would say I was emotionally abusive, but she remained strong. She believed we were meant to be together and felt that since she had destroyed our lives, she had to rebuild them alone until I saw what she saw. She was committed to giving me the time I needed. Six months after she moved back in, I had a breakthrough. After a particularly rough day of triggers, I locked myself in the bedroom, feeling like I couldn't go on. My wife knocked on the door and quietly said, you need to talk. I'll be out here when you're ready. I heard her slide down the door, sit on the floor, and lean her back against it. For an hour, she sat there. It was almost midnight when I opened the door. She asked if she could come in and I said no, but suggested we go to her room. We went to her room. She sat on the bed, and I sat in a chair. I finally told her what happened after I kicked her out the night I found out about the affair. Flashback to the evening of D-Day. After she drove off, I spent what felt like an eternity in my son's room, watching him sleep peacefully. I gathered the checkbook, bill ledger, and a copy of the life insurance policy, placing them conspicuously on the kitchen table. I then took a long, hot shower, trying to wash away the despair. Afterwards, I went into the bedroom, retrieved my shotgun from the closet shelf, and laid it on the bed. I dressed in a pair of jeans and a button-down shirt, meticulously tucking it in, and combing my hair. I sat on the bed, staring at the gun, contemplating my next move. Hours passed before I finally got up, unloaded the gun, and put it back. I stripped off my clothes and collapsed into bed, exhausted. I think many betrayed spouses faced these dark moments. I explained to her that this was the one thing I'd kept hidden during our recovery. For the first time, I let her hug me, 
and kiss me on the forehead in a gesture that wasn't a goodbye or see you later. It was the first emotional connection I allowed her to have with me. I told her I forgave her that night, but I didn't truly mean it. It took months before I genuinely meant it, but saying the words then opened a door for me. Gradually, physical touch became more frequent. Holding hands, a kiss goodbye, a hug. These gestures started to become normal again in our relationship. While sex was still off the table, we were moving in that direction. Nearly a year after she moved back in, we finally became intimate again. This was our period of hysterical bonding. She kept journaling, and according to her, we had sex 32 times in 28 days. Years later, she confided that until that night we became intimate, she woke up every morning thinking it might be our last day together. She kept telling herself, just one more day. She knew that sex meant I was beginning to rebond with her. Today, we have a strong marriage and successful careers. We have three grown children who, as far as we know, are unaware of our past struggles. We have no plans to tell them, but we won't lie if they ask. We've both changed a lot. My wife has become stronger and wiser, viewing this ordeal as a painful but ultimately transformative experience. I sometimes think she still punishes herself for it. For my part, the affair doesn't come up in discussions or arguments anymore. It hasn't in over 20 years. She's very perceptive and often senses when I experience a trigger. Yes, they still happen, maybe once or twice a year. They are brief, but sting deeply. Usually she will hold my hand, hug me, and say, I love you, or simply, thank you. I lost some of the good in myself. I hold a lot of my feelings back and deal with them on my own. While I try to support her emotional needs, she knows I won't be her emotional crutch anymore. It's her responsibility to communicate her issues and put forth a plan to address them, which I will help implement. I love her. I had to learn to love her again. It's different now, more realistic, but still intense. As I said earlier, I feel I had to lose a part of the good in me so she could become a better person. At this point in my life, I'm okay with that. I hope this helps someone. Every situation is different, but this worked for us, and I'm grateful for that. I'm not advocating for reconciliation. I'm advocating for self-care. Handle yourself. Focus on what you can control, not what you can't. Do what benefits you and your situation. Be selfish to a point. Then consider becoming a we again in a marriage or relationship. Google the serenity prayer. No truer words have ever been written in my opinion. And remember, this sub is about surviving infidelity. You're reading about the worst days of our lives in marriage. We've created 